there we go right let me just see if my lovely colleague emily is here she is fantastic so i'm gonna add emily um so you can come and join me emily this is um the lovely hello hi. hello how are you i'm good how are you good i'm looking really blue today i don't know why i think it's because i've got a yellow top on it doesn't like my face i was gonna say i'm loving the cardi you've got yes. some spectacles on your uh spectacles yeah yeah, this is a um, special. Fantastic. Yeah. Make them look a bit randomly sort of purple, but I have been for a run, so I think I'm probably just that colour anyway. Looking gorgeous, um, darling. Looking gorgeous. <laughs> um, so this is the lovely Emily Dell, who is a colleague of mine. She's a blue badge guy. Um, and as, alongside that, she is a phenomenal artist. And I've actually commissioned a piece from you, haven't I, Emily? Yeah. Uh, Stupidly, I meant to bring up a picture of yours, um, but maybe you can hold one up at the end uh, to show everybody. Um, but I asked Emily to join me today. Um, this is the first guest we've had on Women's Wednesdays. So thank you for doing that. Um, because you are a very big fan of art generally. Um, but in particular, you do a fantastic tour at the Tate Modern, which is sort of female rebels of the Tate Modern, isn't it? Yes. Which is wonderful. And, and um, us guides are really lucky because we have a, a whole variety of different talks that are going on during this period and Emily's doing her tour for us tomorrow so I'm thrilled about that um so when I said to you do you fancy coming on you said actually can I can I do a women's Wednesdays on uh Cara Walker who you are a very big fan of I am and this is her here um now she's she's not British is she so this is a bit of a departure for us going for a non-British person on Global Tea Break. Um, so why, how did you come across her? Where did you sort of see her for the first time? So I saw her for the first time when I actually entered the Tate Modern um, at the latter part of last year. And she had her piece in the Turbine Hall. And, you know, if, if you're an artist and you get the opportunity to create something in the Turbine Hall, you have to make sure you do something that makes people stop straight away. Yes. So then it kind of, you know, filters everybody around the gallery. Uh, and with this piece, you don't just see it, but you hear it as well. So she created this amazing fountain. And I just thought, who on earth is this, is this woman? There it is. There it is. Um, so, yeah, I just started to, you know, find out a little bit more about her. And she's just really intriguing. And just, you know, her work is, is quite political and it really does touch your heart. Oh, and we should say, just to put it into context, this, this building that you're looking at here, um, this is the Turbine Hall of the Tate Modern um, Art Gallery. And the Tate Modern is, well, it used to be a... Um, an oil-fired power station on on the banks of the River Thames, all the way up to the 1980s, which is, I mean, I, whenever I say that, I think 80s, really, an oil fired power station That's in the it. middle of London. Yeah. Um, but it's absolutely huge. And the bit at the back, which is what this is, the turbine hall, it is, as the name suggests, where the turbine would have been. And to give you a sense of scale in there, um, it looks fairly standard size, but if you look on the left-hand side, you can see there are some little green glass bits. The bottom green glass bit is one floor, and then the top green bit sticking out is, I think, the fourth floor, possibly? Yeah, third? yeah, yeah, fourth floor. That's how tall we're talking. It is an immense space. Mm. So if you are asked to do something there, like you say, you've got to make it big and you've got to make it show stuff. You have to make it punch you in the face as soon as you walk in. Yeah. So um, she, I mentioned that she's, she's not British, she's American. Um, so let's go back to the start of, of Cara Walker's life and... and Let's start from there and kind of how it influences that, that led her up to, to this point of, of being um, on show in the, in the Tate Modern Art Gallery. Yeah, so she was born in 1969 in California and uh, her father was a painter and also a professor at a university. So she was hugely influenced by her dad. And one of her earliest memories is when she's about two or three years of age. I mean, goodness me. She sat on her dad's lap and she's watching him paint and she's thinking, yep. Yeah, I want to do that. And then from that moment, she saw herself as a painter. So from a very early age, you know, she's always drawing and sketching and all sorts of things. Um, from California, the family moved to Atlanta. And this is where she enrolls in Atlanta University of Fine Art. Uh, eventually after that, she goes to Rhode Island School of Design. Now at this point, and we're in the kind of 1990s, she's quite shy um, and she experiences quite a lot of bullying through her early period of education uh, in the way, in particular, of racism. Yeah. And she didn't really know what to do with that. You know, she kind of felt like she needed to kind of speak about it in some way, but she didn't know how. And then eventually she managed to find her voice. And this was, you know, in the way 
of art. And so um, the reason that we're kind of picking up on her today is not just because she's had a Tate Modern um, exhibition, but it's that her art is, a lot of it, like you say, a lot of it's very political, but mm. a lot of it links into the transatlantic slave trade yeah. and the, the th you know, the, so, well, the implication that Britain had in that, which we are going to do a talk on at some point, but um, it's, a, it's a topic I find fascinating. Um, and so, you know, realistically, in, in America, the, the sort of effects of the transatlantic slave trade are the fact that that's where the enslaved people were. But the whole kind of subjugation of um, the enslaved people and the black Africans was coming from, from, well, not exclusively England, but a major player was England. Absolutely. And as well, that the... the the statue that in the Tate Modern was inspired by something in London, wasn't it? It was, it was. Yes, you you might have seen it if you've passed Buckingham Palace. I mean, you can't miss it. There it is. There it so is. It's a huge memorial um, and dedication to Queen Victoria. So yeah. it was a very here on this side that's Queen Victoria there yeah exactly so this was uh, put in place um, after she died and you know on either side of her she's got truth she's got justice she's got the winged angel of victory right at the top yeah. and Cara Walker you know she kind of looks at memorials and is fascinated by these allegorical and mythological kind of uh, figures that mean so much but when it comes to memorials, it's very easy to forget about the bad things that's also happened uh, within yeah. the country. So, absolutely, yeah. as well, you know, the, the they always say history is written by the victors, don't they? Mm -hmm. So, memorials yeah. like this, you know, you have the queen, you have victory at the top, you've got all the sort of different continents and all sorts of things going on along the base, and there's no mention of the people who were subjugated and ultimately died in order to sort of well not really help but but you know we're an instrumental part of, of England gaining its sort of its wings as a as a Absolutely. world and you can see that I mean you know to see this picture here and then we go back to the one of the statue you can really see that that influence there and in fact um I think we have a little close up of him maybe not maybe not that that one um the chap with the hat sitting right in the middle there really smacks of Lord Nelson and that kind of naval empire um, with those, you know, tricorn hats, or oh, duo corn, I think here. But anyway, um, and so talk us through a little bit some of the details in the statue. Do you want, do you want the video first, just to give people? Um, let's do the still first. Okay. So I can, yeah, I can talk about it with this little image here. So yeah, so it's thirteen meters high first of all, and straight on the top you have this woman. You have this woman with her head held back. She has there. She so she's got water coming out of her breast. She's got water coming out of her neck. And usually when you see a memorial, you tend to have a female figure. This could be, you know, uh, Venus in the Victoria Memorial, for instance. You've got uh, winged victory. Yeah. And here you have uh, almost kind of uh, Mother Africa. And to look at it from a distance, you, you, it's unbeknown to you that actually it's, it's not a very nice portrayal of this woman at all. Portrayal, her clothes have been ripped off her, her breasts are exposed, and then of course she's got this gash to her neck. So yeah. although the, the, the colour of the, the monument is, is quite bland, you almost get this, this well, rush of colour. It's white, which of course, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so you can kind of imagine this kind of red pouring out from her neck, which uh, is going all the way down to the fountain below. And she's also sinking. If you look at her, it almost looks like it's a, kind of like a wedding cake that is about to collapse. And you can imagine going into the gallery the next day and she's right at the bottom of the fountain, which is where you have the most uh, fearful elements. Because right at the bottom, you have the water, um, you have people trying to escape from the water, and there you go, you've got the sharks. Now, uh, there's one image um, I don't know if you've got it. I might have sent it to you, Alex, where it looks like somebody is being pulled out of the water. Yeah. And upon, <laughs> have you got that one? Uh, upon their back, yeah, there we go. You've got um, little holes, and these holes are meant to resemble bullet holes. So it's not just the Atlantic Ocean that you've got to be careful of if you fall in. Mm. It's not just the sharks that could potentially attack you, but it's also your own kind, the human beings that surround you. And yeah. as you said earlier, this is, you know, all going about the transatlantic slave trade, which uh, heavily links to Britain and the slave trade triangle. Yeah, and there was um, during the slave uh, the, the slave trade era this triangle going uh, across, as you mentioned, um, the, the ships going from Africa over to the Caribbean and to the United States and places like that. Um, 
often they, you know, if, if because I don't know if you want me to bring up a picture of the, the slave ship here. Yeah, yeah, please. That's a great example of one of the ships importing uh, enslaved Africans over to the Caribbean or the US or wherever they were going. And you can see there was absolutely no space for moving there. Um, they are kind of, they, I think they had like sort of three by two foot space, often shackled together, either sitting or lying, no space to get up and move around. And of course, people are, you know, people aren't made to be that way. So people would die. And what they would do is they would just pitch the bodies overboard. And it was said that on a lot of these ships, the sharks would just trail the ship waiting for an easy yeah. So that, that image there of, of the guy, you know, oops, not that one, hang on. Uh, it took me a while to get the right format. There we go. Um, of, of him sort of trying to swim away from the shark is, is quite a, you know, it's quite an accurate one, really. Definitely. And there's also uh, an image of a ship um, that's kind of uh, within the water, within, um, within the memorial. And this ah, is, yeah. um, uh, there we go. This is a connection to JMW Turner's painting, which was called Slave Ship. Now, you mentioned just there, Alex, about, you know, slaves being thrown overboard. So there was a particular time. It's known as the, um, uh, the Zong, Zugo or Zongo um, massacre. Yeah. When you had this slave ship in 1781, and basically every slave on board, um, insurance would be um, uh, purchased upon them. Yeah. So, as cargo, as cargo, we should point out, not as not as human life, but as cargo. No, 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 as cargo exactly. So on this particular voyage, uh, 130 slaves were thrown off the side, so they could claim the insurance back. And this um, suddenly went into the courtrooms. It suddenly went into the press. And this is one of the first real instances where people were talking about these slaves in these plantations and realizing how negative it was. Yeah. And a year later in parliament, a bill was passed to, um, to stop putting so many um, people within these slave ships, you know, tiny little stepping stones, but at least that was, that was something. So this is, um, this is shown in uh, Turner's painting, the slave ship. Yeah, and the Zong was quite a quite a crucial case for that, and that's what something we'll probably pick up on in another chat as well. Now, there's another bit of detail here which is quite interesting. This tree. Yes. Now, so, uh, typically, I think I'm actually covering again the kind of crucial the noose, bit. Noose. Yeah. <laughs> the rope coming down here, and it forms a noose. Yes. So I know it's uh, it's obviously global tea tea time, and you know we don't want to talk about too many things that are a bit you know <laughs> funny. But I should I should mention that the sim symbolism here with the tree, the tree is actually meant to look like um, a little bit like uh, female genitals, oh. and in terms of female. Um, uh, uh, mutilation and things like that. The idea that there is, you know, fear everywhere, and it's not just um, the older um, Africans that were taken to the ships, but there was a lot of a lot of young children as well, in particular, a lot of uh, young girls. Yeah. Um, now, this this is not the only piece that she's done that you uh, particularly like, is it? There, she. No. she there, there's another one which. Um, well, I'm, I'll just bring it up, and you can you can tell me. A little bit about it again this is also no this isn't in the tate is it or is it no it looks no. like the turbine hall, doesn't no, but it? i think yeah. it's quite it yeah, so this is um this is in brooklyn this is in brooklyn and this is in um an old sugar factory called domino's domino sugar factory um this is a piece that doesn't exist anymore this was created in 2014 and cara walker was given the opportunity to create something in this space and initially she thought God, i don't know i don't know if this is for me this is uh, you know, it's just such an epic space. And this is obviously before the turbine hall. Um, and then she starts to smell this, this horrible smell of burnt sugar. And everywhere is really sticky. You've got sugar on the pillars, sugar around the rim of the windows, just absolutely everywhere, molasses. So she decides to create, again, connecting to the sugar plantations and people having to, to work to create the sugar to then bring back uh, for people to enjoy. So this is a huge sphinx, a huge female, again, with the, yeah, yeah, Mother Africa as a sphinx. Um, it's made out of polystyrene, um, and then it's covered in, in kind of like a, a sugar paste. And surrounding the sphinx, you've got lots of figures. Um, I think there might be one. Yes, maybe on the last another. picture there, we had a couple of these. Oh, yes, there we go. There. So um, these are of young boys, and they're carrying various things that, you know, like bananas and, and sugar and various things that they would, they would collect when they were on the plantations. And... It reminds me of these kind of sugar banquets that you would have in the 15th and 16th century, where yeah. sugar was such a, 
you know, a prime commodity. You could only have sugar if you had a lot of money. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth I, for instance, she had a, a sugar addiction. She used to put sugar around the rim of every cup that she drank from. Goodness. And you'd have these banquets where you'd have these big things in the middle of the table, you know, that would look like ships or, or kind of animals, and it'd be made out of sugar. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, it's such a fascinating piece. Amazing. And of course, you know, as well, if you're talking about the transatlantic slave trade, a sugar warehouse is an almost, almost ironic place to have it because the sugar and the molasses is what's the, the, that is the product of this mm. horrifying slave trade. Mm. Um, this is what is being produced and what the world is then kind of, you know, rotating around, if you like. But yeah, the scale yeah. of doing there's yeah. another, that's your place in London, which um, which kind of echoes that like, slightly ironic sentiment. Um, there's a fantastic museum called uh, the Museum of London in Docklands, and it is based in what used to be an old sugar warehouse. And they do have a huge section on the transatlantic slave trade. It's a fantastic museum. It's free to go in as well. I love it. Um, yeah. So again, that that kind of irony of, of it suddenly, you know, having at one time been the place where all of the product of slavery came in is now a bit of a homage to it, which I think is rather lovely. Also, uh, just to say on, on the little figures of the boys, uh, they've kind of used like hard candy, like melted hard candy. Oh. So it kind of looks black and brown and also in parts red. And the red is quite um, important because kind of like blood diamonds, you would have blood sugar where some sugar you would get would have blood in it. Because in terms of the sugar cane, it was such an aggressive process and very sharp. You know, you would yeah. easily kind of cut yourself and blood would go into sugar. Yeah. yeah. Awful, isn't it, really? But there's so many, you know, I, I think it's a very interesting period of history that is it's quite a shameful one for our country. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. And, and I, it's, um, it's incredibly important. And I, I also think it, it informs everything that came after it as well. Um, I often talk when I talk about the Georgian period or, you know, the prosperity in London, generally the big sort of banking industry and all of that. It all links back to the transatlantic slave trade. And I think it's a very important part of the history. It's worth um, definitely worth knowing. Now, one of the last pictures you gave me is this lovely one here. Actually, it's a slightly better version there. Yeah, so uh, she's very famous for her silhouettes. I mean, when it comes to Cara Walker, she doesn't just do, you know, sculptures. She's a writer. She's a beautiful writer. Some of her poems uh, are really, you know, like, oh, just really gets you. Um, so it, she's very well known for her silhouettes. And she always does these kind of these black figures on a white background. And um, some of them, you know, people have protested uh, when she's kind of put them up in galleries and exhibitions because they are very hard hitting, um, you know, that kind of make you want to look away. And that's the thing with her work. It's meant to make you want to look away, but you have to you have to observe it and you yeah. have to be aware of it. So I wanted to show this one because it's just got even though it's just black and white, there's so so much emotion and you've got the rope going close to her neck um you you can see that her her hands at some point were bound yeah and it's just you know it's just an awful image isn't it and you know the thing that i i found the most interesting because i hadn't seen this picture until you sent it to me for this the thing that i found really interesting about it is that's the sort of piece when i looked at it i thought oh that reminds me of um peter pan and you think, oh, and then you look a bit closer and you kind of go, oh, and I think some of the best art does that. It captures your attention. Yeah. It makes you look and then it makes you go, oh, oh hang on. That, that's not quite what I thought it was. Exactly. Uh, it starts looking at details. Yeah. Actually, our lovely colleague, Sarah Chachi, who is um, an art historian. She's amazing. She's the best art talks. Actually, she's coming on next week. Um, she says that she loves the silhouettes and wish we could have some at Tate as well. Oh, yes, me too. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be good. I guess yeah. we've got nothing at Tate other than her um, exhibition, which will, we think, be broken down by the time we come out of lockdown. Yes. Uh, so it, I think it's meant to be there until April. So I don't think it will be there again. And I should just say as well that she uh, is the first um, black woman to have artwork within the term by gallery as well which is amazing wow um and also with the tate another connection to sugar it was commissioned by henry tate who you know of was a sugar refiner invented the sugar cube so the very fact that she's put it right in the heart of yeah. the tate as well it's just and, and there, there is still a sugar that bears his name tate and lyle which is the yeah. uh, the company that he created um which is absolutely fascinating what um so now interestingly the tate because uh, you do these these sort of feminist talks on on the women in, in modern art. Um, the Tate has actually recently made some inroads into um, making the number of women in their galleries a lot more equal, haven't they? 
Yes, I mean, it's not as good as it could be. No. Uh, I, do you know, I think in, in 2011, when it was recorded, I think it was about 70%, 17% were female in Gosh. 2011. So um, when I last looked at it, it was kind of bubbling against 37%, right. just kind of under 40%. So that's much better, but of course it could be even better. Even better. Absolutely. But they're, they're, doing, they're doing very well and they've actually doing very well. along the lines of they want to, to even it out a lot more, which is fantastic. Um, just having a look, little look at some of the questions here. Um, I don't think we've got any questions so much. Um, uh, the lovely Katie Wignall says Emily did an amazing bespoke Somerset House drawing for her, which is oh, lovely. I did. Yeah. Um, and Augusta says there is a book called Blood Sugar about the whole... Um, it's about an example of that. I can't remember exactly what we're talking about at that point, but I think it's about the, the transatlantic slave trade over there. And I will do a chat on it at one point um, if, you know, you're interested, if anyone's interested in doing a little bit more on it, because it is a fascinating subject and really worth know, uh, knowing a bit more about. And before we leave, Emily, can we see a little bit of your art? So you're, you're busy beavering away. Um, Emily, yes. So... Incredible um, drawings. They're sketches um, of a whole variety of different London landmarks or, frankly, anything. If she'll bespoke anything you want. And her hope one is one that... Uh, she put it up on Facebook the other day and we all of us guys went, oh my God, and we've all ordered them, haven't we? How are they going? Yeah, good. So I've had, I've been, you know, I've had about uh, 12 orders from wow. it. And I do them all by hand. So I've got, I've done this one. This isn't completely finished yet, but this is one of them. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? That's, that's one of the ones that I've, um, I've asked you for as well, isn't it? The Hope one. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I've started, I want to do something about, this is just a, I haven't finished this yet, but the idea of um, people, I don't know if you can see that properly. Up, up a little bit. Oh, lovely, yeah. Oh. People with their pots and pans. Yeah. Outside, so. That's gorgeous. And I want to do like, um, have the shard all kind of blue in the sky. And and I've got the clock, which uh, on the hand showing eight o'clock. Oh, lovely. Or something, so yeah. Fantastic. Well, if anyone wants to get in touch with Emily, you either guide Emily on Instagram or sketch underscore history as well. And she does take commissions and all that kind of thing, which is lovely. Yeah. So, thank you so much for joining me today, Emily. Oh, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Um, I'm sure we'll get you back on at some point to talk about something else as well. Um, but for me, oh, tomorrow on Guide London, you'll do... No, no, that's one for us, isn't it? Sorry. That's guides only. Um, that's it, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that's one for us. You can't have that one. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be on at three o'clock with Nara Maitland, who is a fantastic mudlarker. She published a book recently called Mudlarking. It's absolutely fantastic. I've just finished reading it. So um, join us at three it be great. She's going to talk about some of the finds that she finds in the River Thames. Um, it's going to be wonderful. So that'll be at three o'clock. Um, thank you so much, Emily. I'll see everybody tomorrow at three for more fun. Bye. Okay. Bye.